It's a great looking crowd, most of you. Hallelujah. Over in that section. But I'm so thankful for what I feel in the presence of God. What a great message last night by Brother McDonald. I think the best is yet to come. God wouldn't bring us this far just to forget about us. Every trial, every test that you've been through, it all has a purpose and it all has a reason. You just have to have faith in Him. Come on, you just have to have a little bit of faith. Hallelujah. If you'd return to your seats. I give honor to Brother Haney. He's been a great friend to me and my family. The Haney's and Mahaney's go way back. And this church, we're connected. We'll always be connected. And I've got many, many friends here. And I'm thankful that they're here. I know they've been praying for me. Lord knows I'll need it. And let's just see what God wants to do in this place. I feel a really special anointing right now in this place. And if we'll just open up to him, we'll just open up to what he's trying to do for us, you'll be, you'll be happy at what he does in your life. I want to read from Psalms 48 and 1. If you have your Bibles, it tells us, it says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. Great is the Lord. Greatly to be praised. Come on, we serve a great God. Come on, we serve a mighty God. We serve a God that provides for us. We serve a God, serve a God that's a healer for us. In March of 2004, I was in a drug rehab. I know you look at how handsome I am this morning. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's hard to believe that somebody dressed this nice, used to be an IV drug user for 20 years, but look what Jesus does, huh? I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in this drug rehab, facing 40 to life in prison. Now, I was bound by alcohol, drugs, crime, sin, and I was finally set free when I realized who my Redeemer really was, and I was delivered from that very tyranny, from the very grip of sin. Now, I'm, I'm just going to lay some groundwork for you for a little bit. Because of my lifestyle that I lived and I had chosen, I had no relationship with my family. We were very distant. It's not because the love wasn't there. It's because of the difference in my lifestyle compared to theirs. See, theirs was a life dedicated to God. Mine was a life dedicated to sin. I was involved with witchcraft. I'd read your cards. I'd do anything that was against the church is what I wanted to do. If it was good, I wanted to go evil. Everything that I did was based on sin. So there was always this distance between me and my family. But I come to tell you that God took a relationship with my father that at its best was tense, distant, and he put it all back together again. You see, all that strife and anguish and pain that I was going through that had pushed me 
away from my family. The enemy meant that for evil, but God meant it for good. I've got a brother that's watching right now. I had no relationship with him, his children. Now he's my best friend. We talk all the time. See, when God puts things back together, he replaces the thing that the palmer worm tried to eat. Come on. He doesn't just go halfway. He puts it all back together. I started traveling with my father. Now, I was under court order, so I had to get written permission just to even leave the county from the judge. But as long as I was with my dad, the judge would write out a permission slip for me to travel with him. And I started singing before he preached. And for the next three years, we were inseparable. And God began to restore all the things that had been destroyed. So my dad began pouring into me how to be an, an evangelist, how to be a real man. Come on, it takes a man to live for God. And how to live for God. Now, March 2007, I received a call from my mother with great desperation in her voice. And she frantically was telling me, you have to get to the house. There's something wrong with your father. I only lived a few minutes away, and I come flying in the house, and there was my father sitting in his favorite chair, fighting for every breath. I never felt so helpless in my life. There was nothing that I could do to help him. And all I could do was sit there and, and pray for him while the ambulance was trying to get there, rushed to a nearby hospital. Little did I know then that this was to be a start through a valley of trials and pain that was going to start forming who Nick Mahaney was going to be. Not able to treat him at this smaller hospital. He was transported to another place in North Little Rock, Arkansas. One of the last things he said to me was, don't worry about me. I need you to promise me that you'll always take care of your mother. Little did I know at that moment that promise that I made to him would come into fruition this year as she had to move in us in our house with us in uh, April because of Louis body dementia. And I beat the ambulance to the hospital. And I'll never forget when they unloaded him. I was running beside the gurney, and he was already intubated. He was already unconscious. The next couple of days were some of the hardest that I'd ever faced in my life. I'd never been through anything like this, the pain and the hurt. I went down in the chapel of this hospital on the very early morning hours of a Sunday, 1 or 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I began to call on God, and I began to ask God, I need to know what to do. My family's looking at me for support. I don't know what you have in plan for him. Only you know, but would you help me? People were praying from all over the world. I, Kenneth and Joy Haney, for the next two days, every two hours, would call me, and I would walk to the wall where my dad was on the other side of it, and I'd put my hand on that wall, and brother and sister Haney and I would pray and pray and pray and pray. I was in that little chapel. I said, Jesus, please help me. I don't know what I'm going to do. Would you tell me if he's going to make it or not? When I said those words, I began to sing this song. I will give you all, I will give you all, if all you want to ask of me, I will not withhold. And if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, help me remember Calvary's cross and be willing to say yes. The Lord let me know at that moment that this was it. Now, I snuck into the critical care ward where my father was. When I got in there, they had him at an angle in a bed because he was bleeding out, and he was unconscious. He had tubes coming out of his mouth. I could still see his big old hands bruised and tied to the side of the bed. 
And I knelt down beside him, and I began to talk in his ear. I told him, I said, thank you, Dad, for loving me always and never giving up on me. I said, thank you, Dad, for teaching me how to be in an evangelist. I hadn't even preached yet, but he had been pouring everything into me. I knelt down with tears running down my face, and I said, Dad, I swear to you before God right now, what you started, I promise you I'm going to finish. And when I said that, something quickened in his spirit. That man of God set up in that bed with all them tubes coming out, and he puts his face right here, and he begins to just stare in my eyes. I didn't realize it at that moment, but there was a transference of a mantle that was about to come upon me. He began to transfer some things that had, he had been pouring into me. Come on, can I tell you, I'm not about to give up. I'm not about to compromise. Come on, I come into this thing preaching one God, I'm going out preaching one God. I come into this thing preaching Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues, I'm going out preaching the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. Come on, I come into this thing believing in holiness and separation. I'm going out preaching holiness and separation. I made a promise to a prophet. Come on, I'm going to preach this till I don't have anything left in me. Later that morning, 9 a.m., on his favorite day, Sunday, the angels of the Lord came into that room, and I've never experienced anything like it. You could barely stand in the presence of God, and they came and they took him home. You could feel the power of Almighty God in that room. My brother stands up and begins to read John 14 and 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me, because in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. My mother began quoting the Shema in Hebrew, and he was gone. That was Sunday morning. March 11th, 2007. Sunday night, March 11, 2007, I preached my first sermon and I baptized my first drug addict that night. Can I tell you, since then I've been blessed. I've baptized thousands of people all over the world. Come on, because I made a promise. I didn't realize it, but the crushing had started on me. Come on, the trial had started on me. But I preached, and I began to preach. I couldn't preach maybe 10 minutes, but God would honor it, and people would run to the front, and we would, they would be healed. We'd be baptized in them, and they'd be filled with the Holy Ghost. I had no idea what I was doing. A lot of people said, call me, and I'd call them. They wouldn't answer. Y'all know who you were if you're watching. It's all right. Hope you repented. There's two men I could call. One of them was David Smith, and the other one was Doug Kleindentz. And I called them all the time. And they'd say, here's what you do, Nikki. And they'd help me. And God began to move in my life. October 18th, 2008, I was sitting in the hotel lobby at General Conference. I received a phone call from my son, and in the background, I could hear frantic voices, and I heard them say, we're so sorry. There is nothing we can do. He's gone. And they were talking about my grandson, Charlie. At three months old, he just quit breathing, SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, and he was gone. And I was sitting there, and I was wondering, how am I going to tell my mother, who a year ago lost her husband, that all she talked about was this little grandson, Charlie. I called Brother Huntley and Brother Mark Foster. They were longtime friends of my family. And they met me in the lobby, and they went upstairs to go talk to my mother. 
I'll never forget as that man of God, Brother Huntley, knelt down in front of at my mother's feet. He said, Nita, I'm so sorry to inform you this, but your grandson has passed away. I, the sound and the scream of her agony still echoes in my mind. As she screamed, she literally ran up the wall in the room and we had to subdue her. I'd only been preaching just a little more than a year. I was trying to evangelize, hoping somebody would just maybe ask me to come preach for them. I borrowed my friend Joe Hart's Volvo and we loaded up and we headed home to have a funeral. Just married, my new family, and here we are heartbroken with the pains of losing my father still fresh. Now I had to look in the casket about this size of my grandson. A year and 10 days later, March 18th, 2009, my sister was 42 years old, was at the church, and she died of a massive heart attack. Now here I am. I'm in my 40s. I still get a little upset because, you know, you go to conference and ain't like everybody 50 below or 40 below. I never started preaching until I was in my 40s. I don't think they're being fair, y'all. I'm a late bloomer. So I'd, I'm trying to evangelize. I'd work during the week doing whatever I could do, lay sod. You have to understand, I didn't have a skill set to fall back on. I was a meth cook. I was a burglar. I've heard guys say, well, I think I'm just going to quit and go back to what my degree is. Well, I don't have a degree. <laughs> I don't have no choice. I got to keep going on. I got to keep on pressing. My wife, she, is this all right? My wife has a degree in early childhood development, so she was teaching, and we were starving and struggling to get by. But I'd made that promise to a prophet on his deathbed that I'd finish what he started. Everywhere I went, it wasn't the preaching, but God would move. He honored the sacrifice. People were getting filled and baptized, and we were starting to get busy. My wife received a big raise on her job because the favor of God was upon us, and we were able to move into a nicer home, and we had a way much better life. But if you want to be used by him, don't get too comfortable. Come on. You better be careful when you start praying, God, I need you to use me. I want to go to the next level because you better be ready. Come on. I could have coasted right then and everything would have been fine. But no, on my face praying, God spoke to me. God said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sell everything you have. I want you to buy an RV and I want you and your wife. And we just gotten guardianship of our grandkids who we eventually adopted. They were two and a half and five and hit the road. So for five years... We traveled in a 40-foot long tornado magnet. With two kids and a chihuahua. And the chihuahua was the best one of the whole bunch. I'm not built for an RV. I don't know if y'all can tell that. I finally just put scrunchies, you know, in the shower, and I would just turn. I know that's a bad picture. <laughs> Forgive me. But we began to travel. This is when I made connections with Christian Life Center. I remember one time I'm backing my trailer up. You want to test your marriage? I should be doing marriage seminars because of all the times my wife guided me in with an RV. If your marriage can survive that, you got a strong marriage. I remember we were arguing, backing in for Landmark, 
And I get a call from Brother Lopez. He goes, oh, by the way, you're preaching men's day. What? That's what I love about Landmark. I found out Monday I was preaching today, just to let you know. I remember one year they called me in Thanksgiving, and I thought it was a joke. Hey, we want you to do men's day. And I was like, whatever. Y'all never call this early. And now I'm, I'm, for the last, I think, 14 years, I've been a part of the greatest conference I've ever seen in my life. At the very same time, God opened up the Philippines to me. Now, after 17 trips, I've baptized thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I've walked into eight different prisons where I was the first American to ever walk in and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've walked into prisons where when I walked in, they were screaming out my name and they didn't have any idea who I was. You see, I'd learned with my dad traveling with him. We were out here in California at Venice Beach. Anybody been there? Lord help us. And my dad wanted to go. The preacher didn't want to take him, but he said, take me to Venice Beach. And I'll never forget, they were having some kind of fair or something going on there. And they had all, all kinds of fortune tellers, card readers. They had... People with crystal ball, you know, looking in it. We step out on that boardwalk. My dad had a short sleeve shirt on. My dad had tattoos all over him. He said when they read out of stuff to read in jail, they just read him. He had so many tattoos. He didn't look like Reverend Charles Mahaney, international evangelist. But when he stepped his foot on that boardwalk, that man that was sitting right here reading tarot cards stood up and said, Charles Mahaney! What are you doing in our territory? Uh-oh. It wasn't just him. They started standing up, screaming, Hey, evangelists, we hate you. Get out of our territory. I looked at the dude walking with me. I said, bro, they ain't calling me in your name out. And I watched my father in a whole new light. He walked down through the middle of them, and he messed with every one of them. There was a lady who had a crystal ball. My dad said, ha! She about fell out. My dad said, you didn't see that one, did you, homie? They had this balcony. Madam, I don't know what her name was, card reader. And the lady on the balcony screamed, like everybody wasn't watching this now anyway. She screams and leaps off the balcony and lands between me and my father. And she's growling and hissing and on all fours, you know. And I hadn't been in church very long. I was about to pop her in the soup cooler. My dad just walks down there with that lady behind her, and I'm like, man, what is going on? Until he had enough of it. And he turns around and said, get out of here. That woman throws her hands up and goes screaming down the boardwalk. Brother Watts, that, that night I went to my motel, and I stood out, and I looked over L.A., and I began to weep. And I said, God, I don't care if I ever sing a song I don't care if I ever preach a message. I want what I seen my dad have. Because the demons knew who he was. Paul we know. Jesus we know. My father passes away and I heard him. Oh, he ain't going to make it. His daddy's gone. You know how people they talk so much their tongue sunburnt. But they didn't know my prayer life. And I'm at a fellowship rally, me and my new wife. And this lady comes down to the front, man, she's all contorted. She's got voices coming out of her. And the guy speaking walks up to me. He goes, hey, go pray for her. I said, you go pray for her. You're getting a check, bro. Go pray for her. I seen the fear. 
And I said, you know what, move. I'll go pray for this lady. I walked up in front of her, and them spirits were talking, and I said, in the name of Jesus, I silence every spirit that's in your body right now. I said, I want to talk to you, not the spirits. And it just shut down. And I looked at her, and I said, ma'am, I'm ready to cast out every demon in your body if you're ready. She looks at me and goes, nope, I like them. Well, the last three years, my father had been telling me, you're going to run into this. It's just get them out of the church. There's nothing you can do. So I said, all right. And I got to usher, and we took her outside. She walked about 10 steps from me. She turns around and goes, Nick Mahaney, why'd you leave us? And I went, they know my name. I took off running through that church. They know my name. They know my name. Come on, I come to tell you, they know who we are. They know we're not like everybody else. We're one God, Jesus' name, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy rollers. If you ever realize who you are, because they know who you are. Come on, when I get up in the morning, they go, oh, no, he's up again. Come on, I'm not afraid of every devil in California. Come on, I'm not afraid of every devil that comes against me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. They know your name. They know your name. After five years, the Lord speaks to me. Go back to Arkansas. I have a, have a house for you. God honored our sacrifice. 2017, we moved into the nicest house we ever lived in our life. Brother Hart, thank you. Here I am now. I'm booked up a year in advance. 2021, the Lord helped me purchase a house with the land. And 2022 was one of the greatest years of my ministry. The greatest honor I ever received, they asked me to preach Arkansas camp on Friday night, my home district, where it all started, come full circle. Then that fall at Orlando General Conference, I was asked to speak and be a part of the fivefold ministry service. Now, y'all can go back and watch it, but you'll notice there's only one guy preaching that, that night who had a Christian Life Center college pen. I had a smiley face on one side of my lapel and CLC College on the other one. But here's what I learned. Psalm 23 and 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, the key is walking through the valley. Come on, the key is not camping out in the valley. Yea, though I walk, sometimes you just can't Put one foot in front of the other so you have to drag them. Come on. Sometimes you just can't feel like you can go another day, but you just got to keep moving. You just got to keep on walking because you know there's going to be green pasture somewhere he's going to let you lie down in if you'll just keep walking. There's going to be water for you to drink. Come on, the valley may be long and painful. However, he's going to feed you even, even when your enemies are all around you. Come on, there's going to be times in the valley that the shadow of death is going to be there. 
but he's going to comfort you and surely goodness and mercy are going to follow you. But where the real test is what I've learned begins is not the valley. It's when you want to go deeper and you want to be closer to God than you've ever been. Then you've got to go up the mountain. Come on, I'm just going to tell you, the valley's nice and flat. When you're fat, you like nice and flat. I'm a little top heavy. I could fall very easily. The valley might not have been easy, but it's still flat and easier to travel through. But if you want to get to the new horizon with God, you're going to have to climb a mountain. You thought the valley was tough? Wait till you step foot on that mountain. In March, I started my climb up the mountain. I've been praying, God, I'm not happy with what I'm seeing now. I appreciate everything that you're doing in my ministry. But God, I want everybody I pray for to get healed. God, I want to see people getting the Holy Ghost more than I'm seeing now. I'm not seeing enough miracles. I'm not seeing enough baptisms. And you got to be careful because he'll take you there if you want to go. March of last year, my body began to swell up <laughs> even more. And I didn't know it, but my bladder was clogged up. So they rushed me to the emergency room. And when they got me there, they did some scans on me. And they set me and my wife down after they got, I, I, my bladder was so clogged up, they had to drain 1.8 or 9 liters off of me. And it, he said it would have, my bladder would have exploded at two. And I was in excruciating pain. And I couldn't, my body was so sore from being so tensed up in pain. And as we sat in there, the doctor comes in. He says, Mr. Mahaney, I'm not 100% sure, but the radiologist said he is 100% sure they found a big mass in your bladder. And we're going to have to send you to a urologist because it has to come out as quick as possible. That began my climb up this mountain. I wanted to see him. I wanted a new horizon. I wanted, to, I wanted to get closer to him. And we finally get into at, at the urologist, and I'll never forget, I'd been praying, and I just couldn't feel him anymore. I thought, God, have you abandoned me? I don't know what's going on. I'm praying, and I'm not getting any answers. I don't know what to do. My wife and I sat in that car, and we held hands and wept. And I said, God... If you're not going to use my angel or her angel, would you loan us an angel so we can walk into this place with peace? And I walked into that place in turmoil. I walked into that place with my faith at its lowest. The doctor confirmed then and there that I had cancer. And people began to pray. Churches were praying. And I even convinced the doctor. He actually calls me Brother Mahaney because I witnessed to him and tell him about all the miracles I've seen. I convinced him, look, people's praying, can we just run the test again? Man, I was pumped. The tests are going to come back, no cancer, get back to what you're doing. And I went and they re-ran the test and they scheduled a procedure and he come in and looked at me and said, it's even worse. More aggressive than we thought. Hopelessness and devastation begin to set in on me. You know, through all this, God has shown me that we can walk through valleys and mountains and depression can hit you. You know, that's kind of old school. All they need to pray through. Well, I was prayed through and I was fighting depression and fear and anxiety. I was prayed through. I'd get up and read my Bible and pray every morning. And still that spirit was trying to just sink its claws into me. May they performed a surgery and they removed a, a, a tumor about the size of a hamburger patty out of my bladder. And when the test came back, it was a very aggressive, high-grade cancer. My lack of faith, it took a doctor to tell me what God had really actually done for me. 
He said, the miracle, this is what the doctor said. The miracle is it wasn't in your muscle because it would have spread through your whole body. See, God has a plan. We may not see it. I was determined to make it up this mountain. And then came the treatments, the pain, infections, sickness. I remember sitting in my chair, and I'd been there. I couldn't hardly move for about three weeks. And the doctor said, you know what? You need to go to church. They took different things out of my body so I'd be able to go to church. And I got my suit on. Man, I was weak. My wife was going to take everybody to Sunday school and come back and pick me up, help me in the car. I was so excited. When they left, I could barely make it to my chair. I was so weak. My, my body was shaking like this. And I sat in that chair, and I began to weep. God, where are you? And the Lord came to 305 Sandy Creek Drive. Ward, Arkansas, believe it if you want to or not, I don't care. And he moved into my room in my house. The Lord began to speak to my heart right then and there. Here's what he told me. He said, I was asleep on a boat with my disciples. The wind never woke me up. The waves never woke me up. The water rushing in the boat, I never lifted my head off that pillow. He said, but what woke me up was when somebody in that boat said, Master, he said, if you'll call on me, I'm here for you right now. All you got to do is call on my name, and I'm going to help you. You know what I said? Master, Jesus, I need you. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, when I stood up and said, peace, be still, I wasn't talking to the storm. He said, I've created every storm that's ever been in existence. I tell it when to come out. I tell it when to go. He said, I was talking to my people. I was telling them peace. And then I told the storm to be still. I looked it up. I've read it a hundred times. It says, peace, comma, be still. The only thing that stood between me and college was high school. But I know what a comma means in a sentence or in a conversation. It is a pause he said, peace, now be still. I still had the mountain to climb. Come on, I still had, to, had all the trials and the tribulations, but it was different now. Master, I know you're there. Would you talk to the storm for me? The storm was still ripping me apart, but this time it was different because the master was riding in my boat. The master was awake with his head off the pillow. A couple of years ago, my family, another pastor and his wife, and my pastor, Rich Price and Sherry Price, she's a CLC alumni. They're watching. Love my pastor. And our kids, we all went, we got our RVs, and we come out to Colorado. Man, we had the time of our life. We went to Rocky Mountain National Park, and we were going to hike. Me and my wife's the only ones in our 50s in the whole group. Everybody else, you know, they're bouncing around like rabbits up on that mountain. We hiked to Bear Lake where we had a lunch, and somebody said, you think this is beautiful? You need to hike up to Nymph Lake. We were already at 8,500 feet. I don't know if y'all been to 8,500 feet. It's kind of like, Bleh! Nymph Lake was 10,000 feet. So here we started. We get about a third of the way, and I turned to my wife, and I said, my life insurance is with AAA because I think I'm dying. I felt like a goldfish had jumped out of a bowl. And I was getting worried till I seen kids on the side of the mountain sitting down, young people, because it was straight up 
and there was no oxygen. And then I'm a glutton for punishment. And they said, you think this is pretty? There's this waterfall. It's over that way. And I thought, well, we're going down. Let's go. Well, we only went down for just a little bit. To get to the waterfall, whew. I finally told my wife, I said, look, we're the old folks. Let's just pace ourselves, girl. I'm going to die up here. And we made it to that waterfall. And me and my granddaughter climbed up to the top of it. It was beautiful. It was worth everything. But what I learned that the further you go up the mountain, the harder it is. Less oxygen there is. Your muscles are cramping. Your body's aching. And October 31st, on a follow-up visit, they found another spot in my bladder. And they said, because of the aggressiveness of this cancer, we got to do something. And they scheduled a surgery to remove it and do a biopsy. But it was different this time. I was still scared because I'm a hypochondriac. I don't like doctors, dentists, and spiders. If a spider gave me a root canal with a doctor watching, I'd have a heart attack. So I began to pray, you got this, Lord. On December 6th, they found my 38-year-old son. Leaned up against a tree in the woods, dead of a fentanyl overdose. I didn't think it could get any harder. I didn't... I told my wife, I don't know how much more we can take. I'm not saying that no more. And I had to go identify the body of my son. But I had determined that I was not going to give up. Let me tell you something. The enemy came to me. Won't you just give up? For the bounds, you know what the devil told me? Why are you preaching to everybody else when you can't save your own son? Full frontal attack. Me and Brother Klein Dency flew in to my son's funeral. We were in the truck, and Brother and Sister Huntley called me. Brother Huntley said, Nick, I've heard from God, and you're going to have peace before that funeral's over with. I don't know how it happened, but a peace came in. And later that week on my knees before God, I stood up in my house and I said, Devil, you pushed me too far. I'm going to do everything I can in my power to not let another parent look into the casket of a backslid child that died of a drug overdose. Come on, I'm not giving up. I'm going to give it more than I've ever gave it before. I'm not stopping now. Come on, I'm going to get in the fight. I'm ready to watch some demons' heads roll. I'm ready to kick in the devil's teeth. Come on, I'm ready for whatever God has for me. Take me there, Lord. I need a new horizon. We can't afford to give up now. The end is in sight. Come on, keep on scratching, keep on clawing, keep on grabbing a hold, keep on pulling yourself up. Fear is not my future. Death is not my future. Sickness is not my future. You are. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. It's a new horizon. Three weeks ago today, I had another surgery. That's right, they make us tough in Arkansas, people. Two days later, when they got in there, they said, they come back and they, after I woke up, and they said, it didn't look like cancer. So we did a biopsy, and they couldn't stop my bleeding for a while, but two days later, my wife we're sitting in that office. That, that lady walks in. She's got my chart. She looks at me. She said, Mr. Mahaney, 
resume normal activities. You're cancer free. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. Here's what she said. I said, ma'am, I travel and preach for a living. She said, you need to get with it then. She didn't mean that Sunday. I didn't, I took it that Sunday. It like to kill me, but man, we baptized three drug addicts in Jesus' name. Come on. Because I, it's a new horizon. Can I tell you? When you get to the top of the mountain, the seasons are still the same. The wind is still the same. The rain is still the same. The snow is still the same. But you see it differently because you look back and you see everything that God has brought you through. And you know that he did it once. He's going to do it again. I made up my mind. If he's ready, I'm ready to go. But if not, I'm ready to fight. Come on, I'm ready to baptize. <laughs> Sitting there in my chair, God began to speak to me. Said, I, I said, Lord, what have I done wrong? He said, it's not what you've done wrong, it's what you've done right. I'm trying to get you ready. He said, I'm tired of preachers being mean preachers. Oh, don't get mad at me. He said, I never chastise my people like they're chastising my people. There's a difference between strong preaching like Brother McDonald did than being mean preaching where people just can't live good enough for you and you're holier than thou and you do everything better than everybody else. That's not what God called us to do. He called us to love each other. He said, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. You better get like Jesus. You better learn to love. You better have compassion. Psalm 121 and 1. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Oh God which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved because he that keepeth thee, he's not going to sleep. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I come to tell you today, I may not see everything that you're going through, but he does. Come on. Your trial may not be the same as my trial. But in your eyes, it's just as difficult as my trial. And we get to this place in our walk with God. Lord, why am I going through this? Why is the pain great? Why is it more than I can bear? Why am I losing this? Why have I lost that? When he's just molding you and making you. Everything that was in the anointing oil was crushed. If you want to be anointed, you're going to be crushed. If you're going to be anointed, you're going to be bruised. You're going to be hurt. Brother McDonald said it last night. What do you want to do? Do you want to keep coasting? Well, I'll just come to church, pay my tithes, run up and slap the altar clap and jump a little bit or do you want to be a soul winner it's going to come with a price it's going to come with pain it's going to come with hurt but out when you come out on the other side you see a new horizon everything's different 
Come on, I'm gonna tell you something. I used to be a, I, I, from all the stuff I've seen in my past, tears hardly ever found my face. This year, God knocked all that off of me. And the tears just start rolling down my face. Brother Smith, sometimes I'll be sitting in my car and I just begin to weep. And I begin to pray. And I ask God, what do you want me to do? Come on. Because he's opening us up. And if, he, if you don't want him to open you up, just sit back. Just come on, do, go, through the, go through the motions. But if you want to go deeper, it's going to take this. It's going to take an altar of sacrifice. It's going to take an, an altar of hurt. It's going to take on your knees with the tears flowing out of you like great drops of blood. Come on. It's going to take people ridiculing you. It's going, you know what Jesus said? Blessed are those that persecute you for my name's sake. Because that's just like it was from the prophets. Come on. You're blessed. He's wanting to use you. But are you ready to go to that extra, extra step? I want us all to stand. Come on, follow the Holy Ghost. There's about to be a spirit begin to sweep through this place right now. Come on, I, I, I'm not the best preacher. I don't claim to be. I might be the best looking, but I'm not the best preacher. But there's about to be a spirit that sweeps through this place. God's about to speak to your heart, and he's about to tell you some things that you need to get out of your life. You don't need me to get up here and tell you what you need to get out of your life. The Holy Ghost has been convicting you right now. And if you'll follow the Holy Ghost and you'll step out in faith and say, God, I'm not leaving here like I came in, that I'm not leaving here till something breaks in me and so something changes. I'm not happy with what I've been doing now. Come on, there's got to be a hunger there's got to be a drawing that comes across you. Lord, I speak it right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, I feel his anointing and I feel his presence right now. I push back any interference in the name of Jesus Christ. I push back doubt, fear, and disbelief right now. Come on, you want to go to the next level? Then you better get rid of your pride. Come on, you better get rid of all your haughtiness. You better get rid of all these things that's keeping you from being who you're supposed to be in God. You got to get to a place where it's not about you anymore. It's all about him. Come on, he's drawing us. The greatest revival we've ever seen is about to happen, but it can't happen unless we're ready. Come on, you need a miracle in your life? It's here right now. Hello, peace. Hello, joy. Hello, love. It's a new horizon. Come on, there needs to be a cry of repentance that goes up before the throne of God right now. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. You need to start with your heart. You need to search your heart. God, is there hidden places in my heart that I haven't realized? What about the secret sins that I don't think anybody realizes? He realizes it. 
God, touch my mind. Touch my mind right now, Lord. God, let my mind be fixed upon you. Come on, lay your hands on your head right now. God, touch my mind. God, let me be fixed upon you. You make up your mind that you're going to live for him, there's nothing that can stop you. Come on, you get a made-up mind, there's nothing that can hold you back. Come on, are you ready to get out of the valley and start climbing up the mountain? It's not going to be easy. Come on, it's going to take sacrifice. You're going to have to tear down the high places. You're going to have to tear down the groves. You need to find out what the high place is keeping you from getting up that mountain. Come on, are you ready? There's a higher calling. There's a higher calling that he's pressing on us. Here's what I feel in the Holy Ghost. everybody to stand up and I want you to look up here for a minute. I feel it just as strong as anything I've ever felt. I feel the tormentor has been invading your psyche, your mind. It's our nature. Well, we're apostolic. I don't want people to think I'm weak. I remember when I got cancer, my wife said, are you going to tell everybody? I said, I'm putting it on Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. I want people praying. I want everybody in this world to know that I need somebody to touch the throne of God for me. Well, we're here to touch the throne of God for you. I'm talking to some men that the enemy has come against your mind so strong. You won't let your wives know, your friends know, and it's going to take you down if you're not careful. If you don't give in and hit your knees and say, God, I need help. Now, the problem, the difference between us and old time Pentecost, old time Pentecost, you know, the song would be playing, and that old farmer would just come and sit on the altar. You remember that? Nobody thought he was backslid. They just knew he needed something from God. And they did something back then that we've gotten away from. We're going to pray until we pray through. Now we'll just pray a little bit, and you don't see the miraculous boom happen right then. Well, you're going to go to the next one. The enemy is trying to stop you, and his biggest weapon is the war against your mind. We don't have room to people just to get in a certain spot. But if there's a war waging against you right now, lift your hand. Come on. Somebody's about to pray for you. Come on, I'm don't, don't lift your hand just because everybody else is. I'm, this is serious business right now. 
that you're being attacked, depression and anxiety is trying to come. Come on, I need some men and women of God to start walking through here and laying hands on people. And I want you to rebuke fear. I want you to rebuke the very spirit of fear. Come on, I want you to tell it you have no future here right now. Come on, by the authority of the Word of God and the power that's in the name of Jesus, I loose you in this place. Devil, I rebuke that spirit of fear. You have to leave right now. When you leave here, there's going to be a new horizon that you're not walking out of here like you came in. Don't let pride hold you back. Come on, lay hands on their head. Don't just touch them on the shoulder. Take dominion. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Come on, move through here. Come on, let the miracle signs and wonders begin to happen. I take dominion. I take authority. I place it under my feet. Come on, don't let any more groves. Don't let any more high places be in your life. Come on, tear down the high places. Walk in the newness of God. Come on, the enemy's trying to tell you it's defeat, but God, let me tell you today that it's a victory. Come on, you're going to see a victory. The battle belongs to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, we're just getting started. Come on, step into that next level. Now I want you to speak out of your mouth right now. Victory. Come on. Let the enemy know that it's over. That I'm stepping into, the, into victory with Jesus Christ. I'm not turning back. I'm not going back. It's a new horizon. It's a new day. Depression has to leave right now. Come on. Anxiety has to flee. Come on, Romans tells us, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Come on, that there be a renewing of your mind. Come on, let it renew. Let it regenerate. Come on, he's already started. Let him finish it. You want to know why you came to Landmark? Because he wants to renew in you the right mind. You want to know why you're here today? He wants to renew your spirit. He wants to renew your joy. He wants to renew you right now. Come on. 
Go to the next level. Come on, go to the next level. Move to somebody else. Lay hands on them. Begin to speak the prayer of faith. Move to somebody else. You've never spoken in tongues, receive you the Holy Ghost. You've never been baptized in Jesus' name, not the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We'll baptize you right now in the name of Jesus. This is a house of healing. Our hearts are full of you have our full attention You have the final say So we sing Come alive in the name of Jesus Come alive in the name of Jesus This is a house of miracles to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. There's resurrection power. Your life, your life runs through our veins. Your kingdom child. In the name of Jesus, come alive. In the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We sing, come alive. In the name of Jesus, come alive. Jesus, come alive in the name. 